Atmagyana Timirandasya Yananjana Shakaya Shaksurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namine Namaste Saraswate Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirbhishesha Shunyavadi Pashtyatya Desha Tarine Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Adveta Gadadhar Shri Asadi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Adveta Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shiva Sadi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Krishna, Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama. 
Sri-sri-radha-krishna-gov-gopinath <laughs> Sham Kunradha Kundigiri Govardhan ki jai, Vrindavan Tham ki jai, Navadip Tham ki jai, Jagannath Puri ki jai, Ganga Mai ki jai, Jamana Mai ki jai, Tulsi Devi ki jai, Bhakti Devi ki jai, Samaveta Bhakta Vrinda ki jai. All glories to the assembled devotees. All glories to the assembled devotees. All glories to the assembled devotees. Go or pray, Mananda. Hari Hari Bo. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Thank you very much, Akendra Prabhu, for ecstatic kirtan, and thank you very much, dear devotees, for joining once again. As uh, after a little bit of a break, we're continuing from Srimad Bhagavatam where we left off. Um, with uh, we're on the second candle, chapter six, which is Purusha Shukta confirmed, verse number thirty-two, and we're sharing that on the chat if you'd like to follow along. Thank you. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Madam Gopal Prabhu, and thank you, Akendra Prabhu. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Devaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Ajnana Timiran Hasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Shakshurn Miritam Smai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Manobhistam Stapitam Jaina Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadal Maihyam Dathati Shapadantikam 
Bande hung Shri Guru, Shri Tatapata Kamala, Shri Gurun Vaishnavamscha, Shri Rupam Shagrajatam, Shahagana Raganatan Vitam Stam Sadidam, Sadvaitam Savatutam, Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam, Shri Radha Krishna Padan, Sahagana Lalita Sri Vishakan Vitamstra. Hey Krishna Karuna Sintho Dina Bandho Jagatpate. Go Pesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostute. Tapta Kam Shana Gaurangi Radhe Brindavaneshari Prisha Panu Sute Devi Pranamami Hori Priye. Vansha ko patrubhyascha kripa sinto pievacha patita nam pavanebhyo vaishnavebhyo namo nama Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Adjaita Gadadha Shri Vashari Gaurakta Nanda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare We're continuing to hear about the Purusha Shukta confirmed. Lord Brahma has been talking about the process of creation. Now he says, Srijamitan Yukto Hang Haro Haditad Vashaha Vishvam Purusha Rupena Paripati Trishokti Drik Srijami Aham. Uh, I create, Lord Brahma, that was the original question by Narada. We see that you're the creator, but it uh, doesn't seem that you're the, uh, the top man. It seems that there's someone beyond you. Uh, so Lord Brahma uh, acknowledges, Sujamiham, I create, but Tandiyukta, by his arrangement, uh, being hooked up with him, uh, I'm able to create, not by my own power. Brahmaye Shajagadanda Vidhana Karta. As a, what is that? Vasvanya Tasma Sakaleshu Nijesh Shukteja Sri Yamki Atpakatiyatya Pitadvata. The, when there's some, uh, jewels, they shine in reflected light. They don't have a light of their own. They, they're, they're valuable, they, they, they certainly shine, but uh, in reflected light. So Lord Brahma creates, but by the, he gets his power from Govinda the personality of Godhead, by his appointment, by his power, empowerment, Lord Brahma creates. Srijami tam niyuktoham and haro harati tad vashaha. Harati means uh, destroys, takes, wipes out everything. Hara is Lord Shiva. Uh, so haro harati, Lord Shiva destroys, but tad vashaha, under uh, the control of that personality of Godhead. Vasha means uh, subordination, control. Uh, the in Bhagavad Gita Avasham uh, Prakater Vishat, when it's described how the universes are created and destroyed, just created and destroyed, and the living entities are uh, appear and disappear accordingly. Uh, avasham, it happens, uh, the living entities are helpless, they can't do anything about it. Avasham, Prakritera Vashat, because they're under the control of Prakriti. So Vasha means uh, subordination, control. Uh, Lord Shiva create, destroys under the control of Krishna. Uh, Vishvam Purusha Rupena. Uh, paripati, trishakti, drik. 
the whole universe is maintained, paripati, purushu uh, rupena, by the personality of Godhead in his purusha uh, form, the, as the personality of Godhead through the Purusha avatars, the, yes, the Lord maintains the universe. Srila Prabhupada comments somewhere that when you build a house, you hire a contractor. When you want to tear it down, you hire a contractor. But to maintain it, that you do yourself. Mm -hmm. That you do yourself. When you're living in the house, you maintain it. Uh, but to build it or to tear it down, you hire someone. So the Lord deputes Lord Brahma to create. He deputes Lord Shiva to destroy. But he himself maintains the cosmic manifestation. The creation is done through the mode of goodness, destruction through ignorance. I'm uh, sorry, creation through passion, destruction through ignorance. And maintenance is done through goodness. Uh, maybe we'll talk about that a little more as we go on. And Tri Shakti Drik, the Lord is the controller of the three energies. Srila Prabhupada will talk about that in the purport. Uh, by his will, I create, Lord Shiva destroys, and he himself in his eternal form as the personality of Godhead maintains everything. He is the powerful controller of these three energies. And Prabhupada comments that conception, conception of one without a second is clearly confirmed here. There's the one is Vasudev. Vasudev is Sarvamiti. Krishna is uh, everything. So there's oneness, but not impersonal oneness. Uh, personal oneness. Only by his different energies and expansions are different manifestations, both in the material and in the spiritual worlds, maintained. In the Vedic hymns also, the same Vasudeva is held to be supreme. Vasudeva paro brahman nachanyor to sti, nachanyor to sti tattvataha. In fact, there's no greater truth than Vasudev. And in Bhagavad Gita, Mata Parataram Nanyat Kinchi Dasti Tananjai, nothing is above me, Krishna. So the conception of oneness, as overly stressed by the impersonalist, is also accepted by the personalist devotees of the Lord. The difference is that the impersonalist denies personality in the ultimate issue, whereas the devotee gives more importance to the personality of Godhead. The point is, is um, pertinent, overly stressed by the impersonalist. We're not against oneness. We, it's also part of our um, understanding, uh, Advaita, um, Krishna, there's oneness, there's non-duality, there's uh, even an impersonal aspect of the absolute truth. But that's not the whole story. The impersonalists, that they just keep beating that drum, everything is one, everything is one, everything is one, everything is one. And all right, everything's one. But how is everything one? that uh, the devotees can explain more clearly because the philosophy of oneness in which there's the personality of Godhead as the Supreme One and where he has different energies working in different ways. Conception makes sense and everything is just somehow an illusion that comes from, well, where does it come from? That understanding is quite problematic. Srimad Bhagavatam explains this truth 
where Vasudeva is one without a second, is all powerful. He can expand himself as well as display his omnipotencies. Now Prabhupada explains Tri Shakti Drik, the you know, controller of three Shaktis, three energies. There's internal, marginal, and external. There's goodness, passion, and ignorance. On the spiritual side, there's Samvit, Sandini, and uh, Latini. So in this way, you get Tri Shakti looked at from different points of view. The marginal potency, the living entities, uh, is also spiritual. Prakriti, Vidhi, Me, Param. But the living entities are never equal to the Lord. The Lord the Samya Atishai. That's one I haven't seen before. Nirasta Sam, Samya Atishai. Mm, an interesting one. It's an interesting one. Well, I won't go looking for it. No one is equal to or greater than the Supreme Lord. Matta Paratharam Nanya Kinchi Dasti Tanjai. Now there's also in the 11th chapter, Arjun says to Krishna, Natvat, uh, what is that? I always forget that text, but it's quite pertinent. Kutonyo Natvat Samastya Pyadika Kutonyo. It's amazing. You pick up this little uh, Bhagavad Gita verse book, and all the verses come to you. It has a mystic potency. Natvat Samastya Pyadika Kutonyo. You don't even have to open it up. Okay. I, some scientific exploration has to be done on how that works. Um, the, so this is the situation. Arjuna says to Krishna, no one is equal to you, so where's the question of anyone being greater than you? No one's even equal. This is asamurdva, asama urdva. No one's the same, as good as Krishna, and certainly no one is better than Krishna. So all the living entities, including even such great personalities as Lord Brahma and Lord Shiva, are all subordinate to the Lord. Uh, and in the material world, he, in his eternal form of Vishnu, he maintains and controls all the affairs of the demigods, including Brahma and Shiva. There's, a, um, there's some relevant comments by, naturally they're relevant, Srila Abhishnath Chakravarti Thakur. He points out that this verse is answering the question asked at the beginning by Narada about who does this creation depend on, uh, or rather whom do you depend on to create. And we, Vishnath Chakravarti Thakur also points out that Brahma and Shiva are connected with, with Rajas and Tamas, whereas Lord Vishnu is uh, transcendental, even though he's connected with Satvagun, he's Shuddha Sattva, so he's not actually in contact with Satvagun because he's indifferent to it and it can't uh, harm him. Uh, the, that was proven in the incident with mm, described in the Bhagavatam toward the end of the 10th canto. Is the sages wanted to know of these three deities, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, who's supreme? So they appointed. Uh, Yes, Prigumuni. They appointed Prigumuni to uh, go to to investigate the matter. They appointed a, a committee of one to investigate. So Prigumuni first went to Brahma, his father, 
And, but when he approached Lord Brahma, he didn't offer any words of praise or respect, which is the duty of the son to, to do. So Brahma started to get angry, but by his superior intelligence, he controlled his anger. But Bhikkhu Muni could see that his anger is building up, but then he was able to control it. Then he went to Lord Shiva and Lord Shiva's his brother. So Lord Shiva was enlivened to see him and at once got up to embrace, embrace him. Bhikkhu Muni said, don't touch me. You're all contaminated. You're full of dust, covered with dust from the crematorium. You're wearing these garlands of, of bones and tatura. Tatura is like belladonna, it's an intoxicant. Uh, your, uh, your, your associates are the ghosts and, and hobgoblins. Uh, don't touch me. So, you're, so Lord Shiva became furious and he, he was prepared to take his trishul, his trident, and just do him in on the spot. But Parvati, his, his better half, uh, pacified him. Uh, he's your brother, don't, don't kill him, just tolerate him. So Lord Shiva uh, came down from full boil So Bhrigu Muni's offenses had been, um, well, first they were verbal to Lord Brahma, and then uh, they were, uh, or mental to Lord Brahma, and then verbal to Lord Shiva. Just, uh, it was a mental offense, the first one, and just didn't say anything. Then he insulted Lord Shiva verbally. And then finally he went to Lord Vishnu, Lord Vishnu was uh, lying down and uh, being, his feet were being massaged by Lakshmi. He's sleeping. And Bhrigamuni came in and kicked him in the chest. So Lord Vishnu woke up and apologized that I was sleeping. I didn't mean, I didn't greet you uh, suitably. And now you must have hurt your foot because my chest is very hard. So uh, please forgive me. So Bhrigu Muni was amazed. This was the uh, superlative offense. He offended him physically, corporally. And the Lord responded in such a gentle manner. So although Lakshmi Devi was not very happy it's said, therefore, that from that time on, Lakshmi has not been very much inclined to the Brahmins, who are therefore uh, poor. But Lord Vishnu didn't take offense. So Lord, so Bhrigu Muni went back to the Brahmins and reported this is the conclusion, that Lord Vishnu is in the transcendental position. All right, are there some questions, comments? There's one explanation by the Shaivite follower that Lord Shiva in this pastime wanted to glory to Vishnu, who is in opulence, and hence made the pretext of being angry. Uh, else he is most dear, always in meditation. Let me just scroll down a bit. Prabhupada says that, that this is what the Shaivites say. That Lord Shiva in this pastime wanted to glorify his, yes, these things go on, that sometimes Lord Vishnu wants to glorify Lord Shiva, sometimes Lord Shiva wants to glorify Lord Vishnu. So these are the exchanges between the devotee and the servant. 
but then of course the question is who's the servant and who's the uh, master and they can't, even if they say, well, he's just had a pretext of being angry, they can't really get away from the fact that Lord Shiva is the one who's associated with the Tamago and Lord Vishnu is associated with the Sattva Guru. There's a, a difference there. The, anyway, you can give your explanation, but we take it on the authority of Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And you can think what you like. At least <laughs> any Hindu has to accept the authority of Bhagavad Gita. And in the Bhagavad Gita, it's clear that aham sarvasya prabhupo mata sarvam prabhartate. That I'm the source of everything. Everything comes from me. Mata Paritaram Nanyat Kinchidasti Tananjaya. No one's superior to me. That's the version of Bhagavad Gita. And of course, Srimad Bhagavatam as well. Is that okay? Any other questions, comments? Uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, let me expand. Haridas says, there are many, Maharaj, many religious people would never consider themselves one with God or God themselves. They will consider God as having qualities found in persons. For example, feelings, thoughts, etc., and also divine powers such as omnipotency, omniscience, etc. But when transcendental form is suggested, that is rejected. Why is that? Yeah, really good question. Um, they wouldn't consider themselves one with God. They wouldn't say, I'm God. They'll say that God is the Supreme. I'm uh, his servant even. Uh, in Islam, that, for example, that sense is very strong. Uh, and consider God as having feelings, thoughts, and divine powers, uh, but then uh, not a form. Why? The Of course, it's hard for me to comment on why the members of a particular religious community would think that way. As far as Judaism is concerned, if I'm not wrong and I'm not well read on this, maybe someone else here is, um, Moses Maimonides, who's a monumental Jewish thinker from maybe medieval times, uh, basically gave a Shankarite argument. Basically said that if, if he had a form, that would limit him. If God has a form, then he's limited. So they, he extrapolated basically from our situation to God's situation. That uh, saying that if, if God having a form means you're local, right? You're in a particular place, which means you're not in other places, but God is all pervading. So if he's in one place, how can he be all pervading? Therefore, you can't limit him to being in one place and uh, having a form residing there. Uh, in Brahma Sangita, Goloka Eva Nivasatya Kilatma Bhuta. Both things are there. He's in a particular place, Goloka Vrindavan, and yet Akilatma Bhuta. He's everywhere. But uh, Maimonides, I believe that I'm right on this although I stand to be corrected if not. Uh, he, he gave essentially a classical Shankarite view that for God to have a form would mean to limit him. Uh, yeah, this reference of Maimonides, uh, I just posted here. It's basically wow, <laughs> you're a good Jewish boy. I'm a good Jew or a good Jew. I don't know, one of the two. <laughs> a good Jew, yes. Good Jew, yes. Or a good Jew. <laughs> or a good Jew, yes. Thank you. 
Uh, let's see. Let's see what Maimonides Muni says. We believe that this oneness is neither, that's God, is neither a body nor a bodily force, nor is he subject to any bodily characteristics, movement, rest, or dwelling, be they ethereal or by chance. Therefore, the sages repudiated the possibility of any cohesion or separation concerning him, as they said, above there is no sitting, standing, division, or cohesion, a usage based on Isaiah eleven fourteen, As the prophet said, who is comparable to the Almighty? For if he had a body, he could not, he could be compared to other bodies. Hmm? Who is comparable to the Almighty? But if he had a body like us, then you could compare him. All the corporeal terms used in the scriptures to describe him, such as walking, standing, sitting, speaking, etc., are metaphorical. As, it is, as the sages have said, the Torah speaks in the language of man. Quite, um, uh, this is the third principle of Jewish thought, as affirmed by the verse, Deuteronomy 4.15, you have not seen any image. That is to say, you cannot conceive of him as having any form because as stated, he is neither a body nor a bodily force. So uh, this, and Maimonides is, is a hugely influential uh, figure. The, the saying is from Moses to Moses. Moses from Moses the prophet to Moses Maimonides. He's of such great stature. And he's basically speaking uh, with the same outlook as Shankaracharya and the mm, impersonalist school. Uh, if God has a form, he would be limited. If God had, uh, yes, if God were sitting or speaking, or the, these are all limitations. Srila Prabhupada calls this cow in the barn philosophy. The, once there was a fire in the, in the barn, now whenever the cow sees red, she thinks it's fire. So we have our bad experience or our, our experience, we won't say good or bad, that bodily form here means limitation. So we think that if God had a form, he would also limit him. And that you know, he would be somehow comparable to us. But in, in, the, in the Bhagavad Gita, uh, or in the Brahma Sangita, Satchidananda Vigraha, his form is completely different in its characteristics. And notice here again that when all of the Bible says that he, he, he was walking in the Garden of Eden, that he, he speaks, he, he, he carries on the, he says, let there be light. He, he does all these things that a person does. So that's all metaphorical. He doesn't really speak. He doesn't really walk. He doesn't really, but then why do, do these other, of course, it's not for me to argue with, uh, well, it's not really arguing with, with Judaism. It's arguing with this very influential exponent of, of a particular idea as having, um, you know, which has had great influence in Judaism. The, if, if, if form limits him, then why don't qualities limit him? Uh, it's, he's slow to anger and of great mercy. Uh, in, in that case, why does that not, not make him comparable to us also? Some, you know, men are quick to anger or slow to anger. So then you have to say, well, that's metaphorical. He doesn't really get angry. Uh, it's just, and you, then you have to do that. And he's a, uh, slow to anger and of great mercy. Is his mercy metaphorical also? Is everything, all of his, all of his personal dealings, 
metaphorical. You really have to toss a lot out from, you know, forget Vedic literature, but from, from biblical literature, you really have to get rid of a lot to, to reach this conclusion. So I think Maimonides has really answered your question quite well. Uh, you asked, how is it that they can think of God as being one and they can think of God as being great and they can think that they're not on this, not comparable to God even. And yet uh, they can say that he's impersonal. Well, Maimonides directly comes out and tells you his reasons, uh, which uh, on inspection turn out to be uh, not really much different from classical Mayavad uh, doctrine. Is that okay? Interesting, and thank you very much for that, that um, research. We have a question from Leela. The Gujaratis can be full of the book. Um, Leela Karpur has raised his hand. Oh, he's raised a hand. Okay, yes, I, there I see it. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please assume a base dog, Lord Shri Prabhupada. Thank you for the class. Uh, completely appreciated and agreeable. Um, you know, one thing that gets me is that, um, you know, a lot of people and consider like, you know, the Orthodox to be very religious. Now, how could somebody declare themselves or other declare, declare them to be religious where they don't even accept God as being personal, as being a person. I mean, it's just kind of like, it's like a two-way street. I mean, I can't, that's one thing I cannot understand. Well, um, being religious and being personal can be seen as two different things. But in our, you know, to be dharmic, that's our, our word for religious is dharmic. So there are many people who are very dharmic uh, Shankaracharya himself was a great dharmic, uh, saintly person. And yet he was an impersonalist. Uh, there may be many who, you know, they, they're learned in Vedic literature. They are highly, you know, they control their senses. They control their minds. They're, uh, you know, they have the qualities of goodness. And they follow the... Vedic literature, which, you know, the Vedic injunctions, which is what religion is sometimes taken to be, that you, you follow the, the principles of dharma. There are many people who are dharmic. In fact, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says that. He says that of many thousands of people, many thousands of souls, someone gets a human life out of them. Some are civilized out of them. Uh, some follow the um, principles of dharma. Out of them, categories and categories, some are devotees. So one may be, you know, from, an, uh, from our point of view, if you're not Krishna conscious, your religion is a waste of time. But from another point of view, no, it's appreciated. These are religious people, but there's, they have to go still further to come to the point of the personality of God. Is that okay? Uh, yes, it's okay. Thank you, Maraj. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there's some comments. Let's see what they are. Mina says, in a wider sense, the form is the way something is or happens. A definition of form. Mm -hmm. yeah, who's, who are we quoting from here? Definition of form. The form is the way something is or happens. Is that Maimonides again? Or uh, Mina, what's, where's, where are we coming from with that? Uh-huh. 
form follows function to Cpria suggests. It seems like these are different ways of sort of um, blurring form. You know, is form form doesn't really mean form. Form means uh, the way something is or the way something happens. Uh, university doesn't really mean a, a school. It, it means kind of um, education in general. Um, you, you know, we, we take a definition and we sort of fuzz it out along the edges and then fuzz it out further and fuzz it out further. And pretty soon uh, cows are camels and, and camels are zebras and zebras are elephants. And it, it goes on in that way uh, by messing, messing around with the definition. But Prabhupada's approach is that when Shastra says form, it means form. When, when, and why, if the form limits him, why does name not limit him? Uh, why do qualities not limit him? Uh, why only form? Why are you picking on form? The, the all of these the, you know, person means form, qualities, name, activities. So they he picks up Maimonides picks up on form and activities as being limiting, but not qualities. And finally, if you get rid of everything, although perhaps he has something to say about qualities also, I don't know. But finally, once you've dumped form, you've dumped activity, you've dumped qualities, what you're left with is uh, pea soup. You know, what you're left with is nirgun, is, is, is the, a faceless, uh, impersonal, abstract, absolute, uh, a philosophized God with whom there's no relationship. And what does love of God mean if God is not a person? And again, it's some sort of abstract or uh, philosophized idea. Maraj, it's, it seems to me they're trying to reconcile the concept of infinite uh, with, uh, with God. And so I think even in the Jewish tradition, they even to try to, like when they spell the word God, they don't put the O in the middle, they put a line through it, you know, G, dash. Well, there, it's, it's sort of, as I understand, as I understand it, as far as I understand it, the name of God is so holy that it shouldn't be. Be uttered. Uh, yeah, it shouldn't be uttered. It shouldn't, you know, we, we don't throw it around like uh, a common commodity. So it sort of indicates the holiness of God's name that it's, it's done that way. But still, um, this was Prabhupada's complaint. It's not a necessary aspect of Judaism that it must be impersonal. But it's been, you know, because Judaism, from my readings for my book, really gives a lot of space for, um, well, speculative thought. You, you start with the scripture, but then you think about it, and you offer different ways of looking at it, and some look at some rabbis look at it this way, some look at it that way. So Maimonides has been hugely influential with his impersonal thought, but it's not that one must read the Hebrew scriptures that way. And we would argue that they're appears to us that they're equally or more amenable to a personal explanation. God said to Moses this, God said to Aaron this, God said to Adam this, God said to Adam to Eve this, he walked here, he sat there, you know, all personal features. So these, uh, those who, who take to well, those who are members of various religious communities can see whether they have something to gain by considering Vedic thought.
there's a, a comment here in the chat box from Praveen to me. One staunch Muslim who does namaz five times daily approached his holy Nara Govind Maharaj at an airport explaining that God is impersonal. I asked him, uh, you do namaz five times daily, does he hear? If he has no ears, why do you pray? The Muslim could not accept that his prayers were not heard. He must have ears. So he was satisfied with Maharaj's answer. So this is, a, again, a point for, for discussion. Uh, it, it will be interesting. Ten, typically, interreligious dialogue uh, often just sort of uh, is an exercise in hand holding and, and, and um, mutual good feeling. And it's almost a rule that we, we don't claim. It is a rule, in fact, in interreligious dialogue that no one claims that, that his own truth trumps anyone else's. Uh, but still, there's room here for members of any religion to see whether they have something to pick up from Vedic knowledge. Prabhupada uh, said, in essence, that this is not a question of my religion, your religion, but this is knowledge. If you get knowledge, uh, then take it. It's not that um, it's Jewish knowledge or Hindu knowledge or Christian knowledge any more than gold is Jewish or Hindu or Christian. So if there's some greater understanding that one can pick up, uh, then pick it up. You remain Muslim, you remain Christian, you remain Jewish. But if there's something here that's valuable for you, then pick it up. There are some uh, advantages of being Jewish, Maharaj, uh, like the space lasers. Apparently that's in the news. You know, Jewish space. people have space lasers that they've been shooting down to start the forest fires in California. That's in the news last couple of days. So Space lasers? Space lasers. Excuse me? Space lasers. Space lasers? Yeah. Are controlled by Jewish people and they start fires in California using them. Oh, I see. Yeah, it started, well, you know, it was just the last couple of days, some of senator or some congresswoman started saying that. Yeah, and, you know, it's not really our, our function here to get into all the ins and outs of, of uh, Jewish culture and it's... <laughs> How, how Jews and their their outlook are are viewed by the rest and Holocaust studies and all of that. It's, it's it gets to be quite interesting, of course, um, that there are various kinds of people in the world, um, and by karma, one would, uh, it's arguably by karma, one takes his birth in a particular community with which has particular. Uh, characteristics or particular um, features. You know, you, you wind up speaking French or German or Italian or Yiddish or, or uh, Greek or whatever it is. And, um, you know, that affects your, your future. You, um, and, and we see that they're different, you know, like, uh, well, there's some funny jokes about, uh, a very funny joke about um, European heaven and European hell. But it, it basically points out the different char characteristics of, you know, like the qualities of the Germans, for example, are very different from the, the qualities of the Italians. Um, not in every case, not that every German is, is like this, and, but the, the general characteristics of Germany are, are quite different from the general characteristics of Italy. Uh, and then again, from Mexico. Uh, the Gujaratis are quite different from the Marwadis. The um, Marwadis are quite different from the Bengalis. The Bengalis are quite different from the South Indians. So there are all these communities in the world, different, uh, yeah, but they're different characteristics. And these all represent different mixtures of, of the modes of nature, different uh, mixtures of, of karmic 
uh, background and reactions. So, you know, the, the, we can have in the future within our university, you know, a department of karmic studies or something like that, or even if we do sociology, our sociology will have things like karma in it. Uh, it's not just that there are different peoples in the world, oh, all of them very interesting, but why are there different people in the world? Why are there different kinds of cultures and communities? It becomes a very interesting subject, but not one for today and not one to be uh, too uh, free and easy with. Uh, Tulsi Priya said, when I see so much trivially, trivially, trivialization of images of Krishna, I sometimes think maybe the prohibition against images of God is a good idea. To name one example, Krishna edited in, into a cartoon of Charlie Brown and Snoopy. Uh, this is done by devotees. Uh, yeah, there's a there is some something to be said about that. That's why, you know, although we often object when you go to temples, so often they don't allow photography. And the, their reason is that you'll take pictures of the deities, and then who knows what you'll do with those pictures? You'll treat them uh, offenses. Uh, as you know, pictures are thrown here and there, pictures are, so yes, these are, it's a, a good point that for us, the therefore, you know, just a, a, a statue of Krishna is the way you might put a statue of Prabhupada said Ashutosh Mukherjee. It's uh, not that you just put a, a statue up of Krishna and it's a statue but the form of Krishna is worshipable. The form of Krishna is worshipable. It's not for, as you say, trivialization. Or, uh, uh, being ignored. So it, it, it is, there, there is something to it that, that we don't want God's form to be reduced to that of and therefore, Prabhupada didn't like animations, by the way, in cartoons. He, he was against the idea of Krishna conscious um, Yeah, and what are they called? Anyway, animated films. Um, of course, perhaps he might change his mind because the, the animation has become so sophisticated these days. But he didn't like the idea that Krishna could be made into something like a cartoon character. He objected to that. Uh, so your point is, is well made, well taken. One new message, let's see what the one new message is. No, there's not one new message. Is there a new message? Any other questions or comments? All right, it seems that Krishna conscious of the Vaishnava tradition, there are other personalist traditions around every Christianity are somewhat of a personalist tradition where they accept our father in heaven. They, they, they kind of have an understanding that there's a, there's a form there, but the details that we have, I don't know if there's any other major tradition that has anything close to the like level of details of what God does as a person, his appearance and so on. Is, are we the only ones who have that in such detail or even to some degree, some kind of details? Because I'm not aware of any other traditions um, other than Krishna consciousness, really. The, of course, Christianity has an interesting approach to personality. They've got a triune God, which is also um, essentially a form of God, and he's definitely personal, uh, regardless of what we might think about God the Father, God the Son is certainly a person. Um, they, you know, it's interesting that I was hearing discussions by some scholars about monotheism, and they sort of, as they were unpacking the idea of monotheism, they, they acknowledged that monotheism gets a little complicated, even in Christianity, uh, 
or other Western religions, so-called Western religions, the, um, it's not so simple as there's just one, you know, God is one, but God is in heaven and God is in earth. How is that? God is one and yet God is three. So it, it's, it, it does get uh, interesting. I don't know where else we would turn for a picture of God with highly elaborated uh, qualities. Someone else might, yeah, pagan religions. I was, that did come to my mind also, actually. You go back to the Greeks and you'll get very detailed descriptions of which uh, are an interesting subject matter. Sadapuda Prabhu had some interest in this also, how there are different sort of uh, um, old traditions that parallel one another in some ways. So that, for example, the picture of, of the universe held up by a giant snake uh, appears in various cultures. And the question, of course, is why? You know, why should that happen in, in you know, widely dispersed cultures in, a, in an age when there wasn't a lot of communication between them. Uh, why, why was that? And there were many, there were other ideas like that that Sadapuda Prabhu pointed out. That I, even when I was a kid, I think I had that idea that it was interesting that they you go to different places and they all had some sort of a, uh, a similarity in, in, in this regard, that the powers of nature were controlled by different gods and goddesses. And that's there in the Vedic culture also. Um, seems that the Greeks didn't go much beyond Indra. Uh, I, as far as I can see, their thunderbolt carrier uh, is, is uh, Zeus is, is quite uh, close to Indra and not very close to Vishnu or Krishna. Uh, that's again an entire, you know, we're interesting tonight's discussions were wide in the area into the wide realms of various speculative ideas of different communities and cultures and, and so on. Um, in any case, when you look to the Bhagavatam, you find, uh, as, as we're hearing, you know, quite explicit and, and specific personal characteristics, all elaborated, his, down to his flute and its, uh, its uh, makara on, on the end and uh, what marks he has on his feet and you know, everything particular and particular and particular. And at the same time, you have a uh, ex exceedingly sophisticated philosophical understanding of how God is, uh, acts through his different energies, how God is one and yet different, uh, a, a view that's sufficiently sophisticated that I think at, at least we can see say each Maimonides, he would have to think about it. It's not that he could just toss it away and say, no, 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 God has no form. With, with a pre presentation like that given in Srimad Bhagavatam, well, with its, its the, the arguments for, given by the Acharyas for God's having a form, he would certainly engage in. Uh, he, and he could side up with Shankara or he could side up with Ravanuja but certainly he would find himself in the midst of a sophisticated discourse. It's not just a batch of sentimentalists going around and say, oh, I love Krishna, oh, Bhagavan. Uh, hey, oh, he's so cute. Uh, there's touch for the Hanamuni, oh, Gyanabhai Raghya Yukte, Pashyanti Atmani Chatmanam Bhaktya Shruta Grihitiya. We have a vast, and sophisticated literature dealing with God's um, various aspects. Or you can say the science of the personality of God. It the Bhagavad Purana is the science of Bhagavan, a, a, a 
highly uh, uh, highly sophisticated or highly developed uh, philosophy, highly you know, well well articulated, well uh, covering you know so many bases, um, contending with so many objections and arguments really getting down into deep philosophical discussions, not just some people who say, oh, I like this God, oh, I like that God. Um, there's devotion uh, with knowledge and detachment and guided by Shastric understanding. So, so much is there that you may accept it or not accept it, but you, if you're a thinking person, you can't really avoid uh, this uh, this knowledge mm. this 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 outlook you can't avoid it it's not just a petty thing where you can say ah you know a batch of uh, savages in in uh, India had these weird ideas um, there's it's sophisticated it's well articulated it draws upon uh, generations of carefully thought out philosophical discourse. It involves um, religion in the sense of, of devotion and action and how you live life there in the context of philosophical understanding. So it certainly can't be ignored or, or set aside if one is thoughtful and honest. And and Mara, some of these discussions are also replete. They're also replete with the explanation of why people make the mistake of going down the path of impersonalism. Like Prabhupada explains in the Vitaraga Bhaya Krota verse that people who are frustrated, they will because of their frustration, there's a psychological reason why impersonalism is attractive. And we understand. You know, so I mean it's complete, you know, it's so complete that we understand why you guys are stuck in that place. And I'll tell you why you're messed up. <laughs> it's it's quite amazing. <laughs> That sounds like good uh, interreligious style. Like you guys are messed up. We're going to tell yeah, oh, yeah. I'm sure they'd love to hear that. You know? <laughs> and we'll tell you why you fell down that pit pitfall. You know, so <laughs> I can say from from another side, just to be to round things out, that we have something to learn from the followers of other traditions also, yeah. in terms of their sincerity, in terms of the depth of their practice, in terms of their fellowship, uh, their dedication. It's not just that we're, we're the, we have the best books, so we're the best people. We also have to have a, a long way to go. Yeah. And maybe uh, with that, we'll, we can end for the evening. Oh, wow. It's already nine o'clock. Didn't realize. Wow. Thank you very much, Maharaj. And thank you, dear devotees, for joining tonight. And we will continue this discussion with the next verse on Monday evening. And we will try to. Uh, line up with the other days as well with uh, the Tuesday, Thursday uh, days. We'll have five days a week uh, speakers and we'll send out posters, information, announcements and all that uh, as we fill them out. So thank you once again. Do you also want to mention the Kirtan that's going on for 10 days? Sorry, Mahaj, uh, which Kirtan? The Nandadula Prabhu's uh, family. Ah, yes, uh, so those devotees who would like to attend the kirtans for the uh, in the wake of Nandula Prabhu, um, I can share the link over here. So this is the kirtan has been going on every evening from 6.30, uh, Eastern time. I think it's 6.30. Uh, yes. Yeah, so I can share that. It's right over here. So this is the Zoom... Zoom uh, link i'm going to share it to everyone in this on the chat box if you're interested please make a note of this you can copy from here uh, so every evening at 6 30 um, you can join on this to listen and participate in the kirtan in honor of who's the grace nandula pro uh, who left our physical vision it's still very much in our hearts so uh, thank you very much please make a note and we will be seeing all of you soon Hare Krishna.
And if you like to say a quick Hare Krishna Maharaj, you can unmute yourself. We'll leave it open for about a few more seconds. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. 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 Hare